Well, the first question for you is help us to please help us in understanding what the common prosperity is. Is um, something really new? Is uh, simply a play a payoff that uh, is bringing to the 14 five years plan? So it's there is something behind the motto. So Eric, thank you, Roberto. Um, um, it's not a new idea at all. It's been around for a very very long time. Um, and in the 1950s, this was as early as it, Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao, when China was a very poor place, he raised, he first talked about the idea of common prosperity. All right. Uh, then, of course, Deng Xiaoping, when the market reforms began, uh, you know, we were a, a very strictly planned economy um, and was falling behind a lot of the economic indicators. So Deng Xiaoping said something uh, which was very famous and let a few people, let some people get rich first. Let's get going, get market for, unleash market forces, uh, pull back, uh, stay planning, uh, and, and let entrepreneurs uh, get rich first. Um, but as I said before, there was a comma after that. It wasn't a full stop. It wasn't a period. It, he said let some people get rich first so that we can achieve common prosperity. Okay, so some people getting rich is a means to an end, not an end in itself. The end is common prosperity. Okay, this was in the, in, in the 1980s uh, when he first uh, began market reform. Um, and then in the 85, when you, if you want to hear something severe uh, that the beloved leader had said, in 1985, and I quote, we will fail if our policies lead to rich-poor polarization. And we will really be on an evil path if some new bourgeoisie is created due to wealth disparity. Okay, this was 1985. Um, so, of course, common prosperity is not new. And it is not a paradigm shift. I would say probably there's been a shift in emphasis instead of a shift in paradigm. But by 2012 and more so by 2017, uh, we're already the second largest economy and probably the largest economy by some measures, measurements. Um, we've had a lot of wealth created, uh, a growing middle class. So, so the primary contradiction is no longer the lack of development, but what's called unbalanced development. And unbalanced development, of course, that's the imbalance between among regions, between rural and urban populations, and also within any given region, within cities even. And, and of course, we, ha we created enormous inequality. Uh, a, a few people at the top getting wealthier and wealthier. Of course, the middle class grew too, uh, but not nearly as much. So we're now, we have enough wealth that we need to enlarge the middle. Okay, uh, so, so your, your question is how do we define common prosperity? Now, I guess the, the easiest way to define it is we want an olive-shaped country, an olive-shaped society. And one of the things that is more difficult to achieve eh, sometime is to ask to the people to give up their privilege. Actually, in this uh, redistribution, we need to ask people to give up some privilege. So, Michele, what is common prosperity from your point of view? Thank you, thank you, Roberto. Very interesting. Uh, I I want to add uh, on what we said uh, before. I I do agree that it's not uh, new, and I think Roberto and Eric reminded it. You guys, you do business in China. You must never, never, never forget that the first line of the constitution of China it says uh, uh, what it is is a uh, Marxist uh, regime uh, dictatorship by the people. So this is uh, the underlying. Uh, philosophy on which this country is run. Now, if there is some electronic engineer here in the room, you have to think that there is a, a trend, a career that leads the country to a full achieved socialist society. And then you have variances in the middle, like the signal, that disconnect a little bit from this long-term trend. So you have a temporary tactical deviation from the goal that must never, never, never be interpreted as a deviation of the ultimate goal, but just as a short-term tactical adjustment. So when people are poor, you do the trickle-down economy and you say, 
whatever, I don't care about disparity, I need to get 800 million people out of poverty, so I let the rich get first. Uh, when, and it is not a coincidence, you have reached the 8 million people out of poverty, so zero poverty line in December 2020, suddenly you go back and say, well, now that I've solved the problem, I get rid of the Stiglitz trickle-down economy, and I return back to my long-term career, which is socialism, equality, fairness. So this concept of common prosperity is not by coincidence that has been brought back, uh, even if the name was mentioned by Brown a long time ago, he re-mentioned it once he got rid and solved the problem of poverty that required this connection from a socialist. You needed to get people rich first. Every, every uh, segment of the society, upper, low, middle income, and this is not like in the United States, uh, a absolute increase in the standard of living. So even if disparity has increased, no uh, segment has been left behind. In China, when you hear something, a new uh, policy, a new uh, direction, it is almost never new, has already been tested has already been trialed in either limited time or limited space. And then you see if the results are successful, you expand it, and when you are confident that this thing is ready to be rolled out on a national basis and also extend along the time horizon, then you announce it. This was the case for the Boston Road in Kazakhstan, 2013, and nothing happened for three years. So this common prosperity is, in a way, some process that has already started in 2012, when urban to rural income disparity had reached its peak of 3.3 times. Since then, thanks also to Hu Jintao, this disparity has been brought down, and now uh, urban to rural disparity has reached the same level, 2.7, that we had in 1978. I then tell you something else about numbers, because I like numbers. Gini coefficient, uh, it's completely useless uh, because it does uh, tell one side of the story. You know, Bill Gates walks into this room and Gini shoots to the roof. <laughs> Am I happy? Yes, maybe I get a job in the Silicon Valley or some money. I'm not like killing myself because the Gini has gone up. So the society polarizes. It's uh, not about disparity, it's about fairness. And I think uh, this is another concept that we need to bring up. And that's why I don't think in China, at least the people that I've talked to, they're not enemies. Of being rich, this is something we have in, mm. right? But here you are angry if it is uh, unfair. Finally, the state versus market. Uh, here we are doing business. So we all, always want that China opens up, uh, becomes a market economy, reciprocity, etc. This is never going to happen, guys. Like wake up. We will not have what uh, a system that is based on the market. For one simple reason, <laughs> the way it works, it is here in China, it works for China. So our demand to change it, uh, both politically and economically, do not find years because the system has delivered 9.5 growth, has lifted people out of poverty, people are happy, uh, they are particularly not uh, unhappy with the political system, uh, and so uh, our uh, demand for China to be more in line with our system uh, will not meet the ears of policymakers that have delivered success. So the question for me, uh, in partially you have already responded, is is the idea of common prosperity telling to the world that we will never be in a market economy? But the market economy is not only something that uh, the Western wants is also something that, uh, in some way, China committed to achieve. And so, is that commitment still valid? Uh, is something that uh, uh, has to be renegotiated? Because we have to consider that nowadays, for the first time, China is not exporting deflation, is import exporting inflation to the rest of the world. So, Michele, Eric, what about the I'm not sure what a market economy means, really. Um, so obviously, you know, you have in every economy you have market forces that determine determine the allocation of resources or the marginal price of a product. 
That's probably the most important. Um, but then, of course, you have political authority that needs to balance market forces. Look, I got your question. I looked at some of these uh, numbers that, you know, we, we China, I guess the, the most significant characteristic of, of China's uh, state and market balance is we have a, a, a pretty large number of state owned enterprises. Okay. So we have, but it, the number has been declining, of course, in the last few decades. It was 100% state owned enterprises in, in 1980. Now it's about 40%. All right? uh, and in Germany, close to 20%. So half, but also significant. In France, uh, uh, over 10%. All right? uh, but you know, we're also one of the lowest tax countries in the world. Okay? Well, you know, our, our, um, uh, our tax to GDP ratio is 20%. Well, in Germany, it's 45 percent. All right. Uh, in France, it's, it's 48 percent. And of our 20 percent, half of that came from state-owned enterprises. So our private sector only contributes 10 percent of the GDP in tax, in tax contribution, which is a lot lower than Germany and France, much, much lower. Our private companies are uh, treated like princes and queens by the local governments. Um, so, so it's, you know, what, what's the market economy? Who, it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's always a balance, right? Uh, quite interesting. If this is a very entrepreneurial country, yeah. and in terms of tax contribution is so low, it's, we might say that it's not such a successful entrepreneurial country. Well, it's, it's, um, that's why we need to make some adjustments. I mean, we're, we're yeah. the only largest economy in the world of, of all the large economies in the world, okay, we are the only country that does not have an inheritance tax, that does not have a capital gain tax, and that does not have a property tax. Yet. 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 That's right. Um, and, and we're the only country of all large economies in the world that does not have these three things, okay? And back to the common prosperity uh, topic, um, another aspect of common prosperity other than inc income inequality uh, that's, that's important here is beyond income is upward mobility. Okay, a, a cornerstone of common prosperity is upward mobility. And before this, in the last 20 years, I think uh, we were seeing a dangerous trend of our country becoming like America or even parts of Europe, which is what I call ossification. Okay. The rich, the newly rich, the Deng Xiaoping said, let, let some people get rich first. And those who got rich first wanted to consolidate their wealth so that other people cannot get rich or richer than them. Okay, and, 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 they, we, it, and it was, it's being done through social structures like education, for instance. Latest, recently we have education reforms, right? Education, uh, we're seeing a dangerous trend of wealthier people continuing their advantage through the education system. So their children are given a better chance of success than ordinary people. Um, so a lot of common prosperity is not just about redistribution of wealth and income, but also leveling the playing field so that people at the lower levels or middle levels, they feel that they can move up. <clears throat> Working in education, uh, I do agree with you that is, there is uh, uh, the need to level the playing field, but maybe this is also uh, a declaration of failure of the previous policies in some way. No? So just to say that we are in a process of adjustment as well. And uh, uh, I would like to um, mention something that you say, uh, different allocation of resources. And sometimes looking at the allocation of resources and looking at the common prosperity, I get the feeling that so there is a dark side of the coin of a common prosperity that is called illusion of richness. So there is the illusion that we can achieve that goal, but maybe it's not so simple. Because, uh, for instance, uh, we have that comma, but that comma uh, has created a level uh, that is not achievable for many people. Think about the real estate, for instance. Uh, compared to the past, uh, how the new generation will afford a life in, uh, uh, under the common prosperity. You're absolutely right. 
Uh, so we need to fix that. Uh, I mean, it's not too late. Thank heaven we're doing it now. Mm. Uh, if we allow this Gilded Age to continue for 10, 20 years, our country will be in big trouble. Okay, uh, so we're not going to allow ourselves to get there. Uh, that's why these adjustments are being, take, be, be, being undertaken, um, structural, uh, structural changes in, in, in the economy, in, 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 in policies, and how we structure our societies, in our ethical and moral standards of our societies. 